All right. Everybody, welcome back. I hope that everybody enjoyed the international panel as much as I did. Next up, I'm very excited about our next speaker we've got lined up. We've got Miss Erica Wagner from Blue Origin. Erica is the Senior Director of Emerging Market Development at Blue Origin. I'll give a quick little background. She'll have a, a keynote speech here, and I get to you know, brag on her resume a little bit, so she doesn't. Um, her interdisciplinary background started with her bachelor's in biomedical engineering from Vanderbilt, master's in aeroastro from MIT, and then follow-on PhD in aerospace and biomedical engineering, also from MIT. After graduation, Dr. Wagner transitioned into a role as science director and executive director of the Mars Gravity Biosatellite Program. She then worked for the XPRIZE Foundation as senior director uh, of exploration prize development and founding executive director of the XPRIZE Lab at MIT. Dr. Wagner served on multiple national and state science and aerospace boards. And she currently serves as the trustee of the Museum of Flight and a member of the National Academy Space Studies Board. She's alumna of the International Space University and associate fellow of AIAA. She's here today to talk about how Blue Origin views the future of space, how orbital reef fits into that future, and why it all matters. Her keynote will run for 25 minutes with a few minutes on the back end for questions. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Hello, hello. It is so nice to be home at MIT. Uh, as Duncan was saying, I had the chance to spend about a decade here collecting degrees and teaching and uh, running a few programs. So it's, it's really nice to be back on campus. I really have had fun this week to see the diversity of perspectives that are going on in the space industry. I was speaking on Wednesday over at the Media Lab uh, about uh, where space intersects with society and change and art and design. And then yesterday, where there's much more of a focus on the technology piece, and today we sort of turn our attention to business. So thank you all for being here in the room. I wanted to tell a little bit about where Blue Origin is coming from, uh, and then share a, a bit about my project that I'm working on these days with an incredible team uh, called the Orbital Reef. So let me get started there. So Blue Origin was founded um, over 20 years ago with a vision of a someday millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. And I think that the three lines are actually really helpful to me when I think about why we do what we do. So millions of people means that you're not just a small crew, you're not just a mission, but we're actually talking about what it takes to get space to the point where we have communities. Living and working in space means that those communities aren't just there to be there, but we have to figure out productive value-based things for them to do and good reasons to be there, businesses for them to build and things for them to create value for. And at Blue Origin anyway, we're focused on that value creation being about for the benefit of Earth. Some people will tell you space is all about the escape valve and we have to have a way to get away from Earth because we're destroying our own planet. Well, I can assure you that we've looked at all the planets in the solar system, <laughs> This is the best one. We've got to figure out how do we put space uh, to work for the rest of our planet. And that means many different things. I, I see Danielle Wood in the back who's helping think about where this comes in, in connection with the sustainable development goals. I, I see some folks around here that are thinking about how do we use space for bringing uh, energy back to the planet? How do we use space for inspiring the next generation? And I think that when we've been talking about this at Blue, we really think about it in this sort of a three-part mission. Uh, radical reduction of launch costs is the, has to be the first gate that we open. Because everything else we want to do in space, as long as launch is ex as expensive as it has been, we're never going to get to the rest of the dream, right? So we've been working on reusability of space systems. You've seen New Shepard go up, come back down, launch, land, repeat, now increasingly moving towards what we call operational reusability, where it really is more like a pit stop than it is like an overhaul of the space shuttle. 
The second part of our mission is learning to utilize in-space resources. You heard from my friends at Honey Bee Robotics a, a couple of panels back. You've, there's been some really neat news coming out from our teams that are doing uh, creation of uh, solar cells from lunar regolith. The in-space resources of utilizing microgravity to do manufacturing, technology development, science, it becomes a really big piece of how we start to connect our planet to the, the wealth of, of resources that are out there. And then for us, because we are looking at a future that is not near term, we're not focused on quarterly earnings, we're not focused on what happens right after graduation, we are focused on something that's generations away. And so that means that for us, inspiring the next generation has to be a part of what we do. And I'll talk a little bit at the end uh, about our Club for the Future educational outreach, uh, but also the work that we're doing with universities uh, across the country. So I got my, got my start at Blue Origin working with our new Shepherd program. When I joined our team, we were 170 people. Uh, as of last week, we are 10,000. Uh, we doubled in size again last year. The, the investments that Jeff has made have really allowed us to grow. The businesses that we are building and the increasing customer bases are, are allowing us to grow. But New Shepherd was really the start of how do we determine uh, the technology base we need to not just be a company uh, that builds rockets, but to be a company that builds the capabilities for building rockets and building businesses, building a team, building a market. And so New Shepard uh, has been doing all sorts of neat things. I, I mostly worked on our payload side of the business doing science, but this is probably the image you've seen if you've only seen one image of New Shepard, and that is us flying our boss to space uh, and bringing him back again, both good things. Um, but for me, the most important part of that day was actually this. So this is Wally Funk, uh, and if you don't know Wally's story, you should. She was a member of the Mercury 13 uh, trainees, and this was a group of 13 astronauts that during the Mercury program were also going through the same medical training, a lot of the same flight training that the Mercury 7 male astronauts were going through. So at the time, we thought that to be an astronaut, you had to be a male military test pilot. Uh, it also meant that you had to be white and American, right? That was a very narrow view of what astronautics means. Um, Jeff was kind enough to, to call up Wally when he was uh, planning his first miss mission and ask her if, he wanted, if she wanted to come with him. Uh, Wally has got the most infectious laugh you will ever hear. She is jolly and fa fantastic. She's also really, really badass. Uh, she was uh, one of the first uh, female flight inspectors for the FAA. She has flown dozens of kinds of aircraft. She's had a, a really storied career. And for me, being able to tell the story of the person who has waited longer than anyone else on the planet to go to space is what New Shepard's all about. You'll hear that it's about the billionaires, let, let the news media tell their thing. But what it's really about is how do we start to tell new stories? We have, uh, since, since this flight, we have flown uh, the first uh, parent-child astronaut. We have flown the first openly LGBTQ astronaut. We have flown the first astronaut from Egypt and Portugal, the first female astronaut from Mexico, and all sorts of other stories that are opening up who envisions themselves as belonging in this community. So super excited about how that continues to grow. When I think about the new space age, and I know there's a lot of ways that people have contextualized that today, uh, this is one of the, the images I think about is a decade ago, we had uh, you know, just two vehicles that were capable of taking people up and down from space. Uh, we had just a handful of flights every year that were taking up people, and the, the maximum capacity we had in orbit at the time was six. We're, as we're growing now, we are seeing a proliferation of opportunities. We have different crew vehicles, we have uh, different uh, LEO destinations. We are increasingly reaching out towards cislunar space. Uh, the number of crewed flights per year has risen and is continuing to rise, and the number of astronauts that we can have at any one time in orbit is going from single digits to double digits. We're on our way to millions. It's gonna take us some time to get there at this pace, but uh, we, are, uh, we are starting to open those doors wider and wider. So the orbital reef is uh, designed to take the place of the International Space Station when it comes to the end of its life. ISS has been an incredible platform. I mean, it really is one of the most complex and interesting things that humanity has ever built. It's a collaboration of more than 15 nations. It is uh, the single most uh, expensive and expansive piece of architecture ever built in space. Uh, it has been home to over 3,000 experiments and science going on from across the world. It's now aging. It is time to replace it. Uh, NASA has said that it is going to continue operations until 2030, and in January of 2031, they are looking to bring it down. So we are trying to figure out how do you replace that in irreplaceable asset, but also how do you do it in a way that's sustainable? 
The International Space Station cost $150 billion to put up, uh, three to five billion dollars a year to operate. That is not sustainable. Uh, it, it has taken us to a new place, though, where we can start to think about how the next generation of technology looks. So the, the orbital reef is designed to be a modular, expansible architecture that serves government missions, it, commercial missions, and private missions, that is open to uh, global space participation as, as a commercial station, and that really starts to think about how do we move to the next generation of efficiency and logistics, uh, efficiency in operations, uh, and openness and participation. So the team of Orbital Reef is anchored by two investing partners, Blue Origin and Sierra Space. Uh, I see my friend Ken Shields in the back if you haven't met the Sierra Space crew. Uh, this is a really fun partnership because these are two companies that really think very similarly about space as a place for commercial business. Uh, Sierra taking in the, one of the largest aerospace rounds ever last year. We are uh, underpinned by a, a really interesting group of teammates that have awesome technologies and experience. Uh, Boeing with the Starliner vehicle and their experience operating and maintaining the ISS. Uh, Redwire with their work from Made in Space and TechShot doing next generation manufacturing and science in orbit. Genesis Engineering, which has this cool little single person spacecraft to get you outside of uh, the station without a spacesuit. Um, ASU, uh, Arizona State University, anchors a team of 15 universities that we're working with to grow and continue to work with the next generation. And then we've partnered with Amazon uh, and AWS to think not only about sort of being world class in logistics, I think a, a lot of folks here at Sloan appreciate how much operations and logistics goes into everything we do. Turns out that that's about 70 to 80% of the cost of the ISS today. So we're looking to get really smart with good partners. Uh, and also working with their AWS group on high performance computing. As we move into space, there will never be a day when we need less data than we do today and that we need to be able to process it more slowly, right? This is an invariant function that's always going to be growing. So we've been thinking about Orbital Reef as a, uh, an architecture that does lots of neat things. Uh, this is a, a picture of our, our research laboratory designed to be two floors, one for uh, biotech and biopharma and biomanufacturing, a second story for doing ma materials science and advanced manufacturing, lots of opportunities here to serve the needs not only of the space agencies of the world but also the increasing uh, in-space manufacturing sector. The core module is uh, envisioned as a thoroughfare. These huge skylights, the biggest windows that will have ever flown in space, giving us an incredible view of the Earth. 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. Right? This is the kind of place that if, if I'm hanging out on the space station, this is where I'm staying. Uh, and we're working with our partners at Sierra to develop their, their life habitat. This is a large expandable module that has living quarters and an awesome gym and a great place to, to sit together and, and eat dinner in, in a galley. Also some, some really cool opportunities for expanding how we grow, grow plants. Think about agriculture, think about food. Together these things make an, an address on orbit that really is starting to give us a place where any business can come and grow. So very prosaically, we talk about this as a business park. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a very sad analogy because most business parks are not very uh, thrilling on the planet, but hopefully it will be the most thrilling business park ever. Um, more eloquently, I prefer to think of it as an ecosystem, and the name Orbital Reef really speaks to that. It's a collection of many small things that make a very strong structure, a very strong community. It's the interaction between the different parts that allows us to grow, and it creates economies of scale uh, and economies of, of community that, that allow us to really do things that have never been done on a government-owned space platform. Orbital Reef is modular, uh, and so we start, imagine starting uh, the, the vehicle at the, the end of this decade, before the ISS retires, with this uh, smaller configuration you see on the left. And I say smaller, not small, because each of these modules is much bigger than you think. Your brain is uh, conditioned to think of ISS modules that are about 4.4 meters across. Uh, we use New Glenn to launch the Orbital Reef with a seven meter fairing. That means that each of these modules is about twice the volume of what you're used to. The life habitat expands uh, to as much as nine and a half meters in diameter. So now we have a, a baseline configuration that's about 90% of the volume of the inter inter International Space Station. You also see that there's no truss structures, right? There are no big backbones. 
ISS put all of its complicated systems outside. And that meant that you had to use really expensive and time-consuming uh, uh, extravehicular activities when you were doing maintenance. We have moved those internal to the space station. We've been thinking from day one about how do you have all of the illities. This is manufacture, uh, manufacturability, operability, maintainability, sustainability, um, so that we have a, a, an architecture that supports all of that. And that allows us to grow as the market grows. And you can imagine that these can be national modules. So a, a new emerging space uh, nation that doesn't have the full capabilities of building an entire space station can still build a module and come up and have its own space presence. So could a university. So could a company. And so we're talking to a lot of different markets about how do we think about this growth configuration and who comes up first. I think that we have never really talked about space as a real estate market. And it becomes a very interesting conversation. So if you sort of walk across this configuration from left to right, you start with the node. That is an airlot. It, it uh, does support EVA because we think we will need to be able to have uh, in, uh, capabilities of testing out spacesuits, of training astronauts, uh, maybe some of our, our initial ops and maintenance. You see the sort of inflated configuration of the life habitat. Again, all the living and working functions. That core module in the center has the, um, the, all of the infrastructure that you might think of for a, a classic you know, power, thermal, uh, guidance, navigation, and control, all of the, all of the classes you take in an aero astro major. And then the, the research uh, module over to the right, the science module. Again, these are at a different scale. So these are actually two images at, at scale. On the left, the International Space Station. At the right, the core module of the orbital reef. So why does that matter? Why is bigger better? Uh, I don't think it inherently is, but it is allowing us to think about ways in which we take the constraints of volume out of the equation for, for businesses, for manufacturing, for science, uh, for other applications like filming movies and playing sports in space. You suddenly have a lot more flexibility about your architecture, uh, your operations, and your design. We are part of NASA's commercial LEO destinations program. Uh, in uh, December of 2021, we were awarded a $130 million grant to get started with the development of, of the station. We've been going through a series of milestones. For those of you who are my engineers in the room, lots of systems engineering going on at the moment. Uh, lots of requirements definition, lots of conceptual design but also a lot of prototyping in parallel. Uh, some great uh, imagery, if you Google the, uh, the life module burst test uh, from Sierra Space, if you like things blowing up, that's a great video to watch this evening. Um, and a lot of business development, starting to think about that B to G, B to B, and B to C that are going to underpin this growth. What comes next in this world is phase two, a contract from NASA that is really the big, the big uh, you know, sort of Apple on the horizon. They are going to down-select uh, to two space stations uh, that will come into orbit at the end of the decade. That, that call for, for proposals is expected in 2025. So you can imagine we are hard at work right now trying to position uh, the, the business and the technology to really be the, the premier op opportunities in low Earth orbit. So why do we do this? Why does it matter that we have a space station at all? And I'm gonna come back to that idea of millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. I'm a gravitational researcher. I care a lot about how gravity affects physical systems, biological systems, how it opens up kind of, uh, manufacturing domains that we just cannot access here on the ground. And whether you're talking about artificial retinas or next generation fiber optic cables or the uh, incredible things that are happening in three-dimensional tissue bioprinting, really cool stuff going on in microgravity today. The extreme conditions uh, are interesting for the Earth. They're more interesting in space for space. When we talk about going, NASA going onto the moon and out to Mars, it is going to continue to need low Earth orbit as a test bed. We continue to need to qualify materials, continue to need to qualify subsystems, continue to need to understand astronaut health. If you think about the gear ratios in the, in the, uh, the rocket equation, it says that for every pound that we're gonna put on the moon, we're gonna bring 10 pounds to LEO for the same price. So low Earth orbit is continuing to be a, a very critical place because of that environment. And that unique vantage point, again, sunrises and sunsets, you know, you're going around the Earth every 90 minutes, but you also have an opportunity now to look down at the Earth, and we've heard a lot about Earth observation today, to look out at the, at the stars and to really do a whole set of, of development that puts you flying over about 90% of the Earth's population with a vantage point anywhere in the universe. 
So this opens up a series of markets, and for the, the business students in the room, these really are six distinct market segments, and we have sub-segmented them all to, to, uh, to quite a bit of effect in terms of affecting, impacting our design. So you have the national space agencies that are doing research. You heard on the last panel, today we have 77 space agencies worldwide. They're increasingly thinking about the role of, of space research in their portfolios. Exploration, again, supporting the, the journeys out to the moon, onto Mars. Big hubs like this support a lot of uh, opportunities for the satellite industry, whether it's gonna be satellite uh, constellation refurbishment, debris mitigation, uh, opportunities to do launch from these platforms. This can, this, having a big centralized resource with lots of power, lots of compute, and lots of uh, capability give, opens up a whole set of options. On the left-hand side, you see the things that are uh, much more commercially oriented. So commercial industry coming on for, for research and development, manufacturing, production, but also the consumer things that we've never really done on the International Space Station because it's a government platform. So we're hearing from folks who want to do a whole range of very commercial activities in space, whether that's filming movies, uh, sports activities, uh, gambling, games, you name it. Somebody wants to do it in space and there's a business to be had. We're gonna be a, a little picky and choosy about what belongs, but uh, I think it, it opens up some really neat opportunities for, for stories that have not yet been told. And then travel and tourism. We've been learning a lot about this market uh, with our new Shepard vehicle. The demand is far greater than the supply in the market today. Uh, when you look, if you look at the history of private astronauts going to the International Space Station, every time more opportunities have been opened up, those have been far oversubscribed. So we know that there's a robust market here. We also know that it's a market that is uniquely sensitive to both risk and cost. So no matter how cheap sp uh, Space Launch has gotten, the number of big satellites and telescopes we launch has not changed. Small satellites and telescopes are, are, are sensitive, but not the big ones. People are very, uh, a, a very uniquely elastic market for, for both of these variables. So as we're working on, on bringing down the cost of access, increasing the reliability, increasing the safety, and increasing the logistics throughput, we start to get in some really interesting points on those demand curves. I will point out uh, an activity going on with the startup community that we call Reef Starter. So this is a, a way for, for small businesses and startups to get involved with what's going on uh, in the Reef community. If you have a startup that is interested in being engaged in LEO, keep your eyes open. We ran our first innovation challenge last year. Over 200 entrants from more than a dozen countries, uh, four uh, winners that, that really came out showing a wide diversity of technologies, looking at manufacturing, looking at biotech, thinking about uh, the, the physics of Earth's ionosphere and how that impacts communications and, and uh, data processing, or data, data handling. Uh, things like nano suspension cooling technologies. I know you heard earlier from EcoAtoms and what they're doing in, in large, uh, high throughput manufacturing and, and biosensors. So I think that there's a lot of places that are starting to come to the forefront and we're thinking about how do we cultivate an ecosystem that comes with us as we're growing these, these, uh, these markets. I will uh, close this part of my remarks by talking about Club for the Future. So back in, in 2019, uh, we established a nonprofit to reach out to the youth of the world and get them excited about STEM and STEAM and space. Again, the vision that we have is not one that closes in my career. It's probably not one that closes in your careers. So that means that we have a responsibility uh, to, to bring the next generation, generation along with us. Club for the Future is doing many things, but my personal favorite is a program called Postcards from Space. How many of you have, have gotten a chance to see or take part in, in the postcards program? Awesome. Um, this is for kids of all ages, so if those of you who are children at, at heart are welcome to come and join us. Uh, we have invited uh, kids around the world to take a blank postcard or a, an index card to draw their vision of the future of space or something that they care deeply about and mail it to us. We then take those postcards, put them on the new Shepard vehicle, launch them to space, bring them home, and mail them back. It is transformative to watch kids who have never thought about seeing something go to space, thought, never touched something that's been to space, be able to say, this is mine, I sent it. And I've seen them on, uh, uh, on, on refrigerators, I've seen them on walls, I've seen them shoved in as bookmarks uh, in, in kids' books, but it's something that I think that really sticks out as, as being deeply personal and putting yourself into that action. I want to highlight a program that we just did uh, through the Carmen Fellowship, working with a, a team in Brunei. They sent us 7,200 postcards. That's 10% of all the school kids in a nation that doesn't even yet have a space agency. 
So wherever you are worldwide, please come join us. It's a totally free program, just the cost of postage. Uh, get involved, send us, send us tens of thousands, send us millions of postcards. We will take them all, and we will help uh, to inspire the next generation together. So with that, I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions. Uh, I'm particularly interested in, in talking about markets and uh, opening space doors wider, but I will take anything that you may have to throw at me. Thank you. I think we've got a mic runner coming up to you. Hi, thank you so much. That was really cool and inspirational. Um, coming out of the stage of the international student panel and keeping the theme, I just want to ask a more questions for the fellow students here, potentially international students. Blue Origin's super cool. Any chance for international students to work in this field, maybe in some part of the market development, like non-technical non roles? If there are or in the future, happy to hear more. So um, Blue Origin is still stuck in the ITAR age. Um, so direct employment is still not an option for us, unfortunately. But increasingly, partnerships are. So the Reef Starter is open to international teams. Our payloads program on New Shepard and Orbital Reef open to international students, businesses, governments. Uh, the Orbital Reef itself, is, we are in discussions with international suppliers, partners, customers, all across the map. So absolutely, it's, it's possible to get engaged. I'm working on trying to figure out how do we change change the US government, it's a slow battle. Thank you for answering. Is this on? Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about uh, biomanufacturing, the future of drug development in space. Um, how has the life science industry been at uh, subscribing to that idea? Um, and is there a lot more work in education in that area? So I think the, the, the key word education is, is really important there. Um, we talk to, to life scientists and, and uh, pharma and biomanufacturing uh, around the world. And I would say when we ask the question, have you ever thought about where your research and development is impacted by gravity? It's not even a question that's on their, their, their radar. Um, we are increasingly having the conversation of, you know, where is gravity getting in the way of your bottom line? What are the difficult problems you're trying to solve that a, a new perspective might be useful on? And I think that that's really interesting. So uh, it, there's a lot of areas that are adjacent to that space that are, are uh, getting funding from NASA, getting funding from the NIH, funding from NSF. Uh, biomanufacturing, because you can grow 3D tissue constructs that don't collapse under their own weight. Uh, Protein crystal growth is kind of an old area in terms of the let's grow big crystals for diffraction and, and, and crystallization uh, or um, crystallography structure uh, development, but we're getting increasingly interest in what happens when you get new form formulations of crystalline structures. So Merck had a drug called Keytruda that they took up to the International Space Station, brought back a new formulation, had an, uh, both an improvement in efficacy and quality of life for dr delivering the drug that they could make on the ground with that knowledge, uh, but also extended their IP. Uh, so, so you start to see that there's investments in, uh, in the knowledge base in the manufacturing space itself, uh, as well as in uh, just sort of how we understand processes and, and the basic fundamentals. Um, I would point you to talking to, to Ken Shields, handsome bald gentleman in the back there, uh, that is really doing a lot of work uh, with, with Sierra Space and, and thinking about uh, where that comes in, into play on the orbital reef. So uh, you have a slide that shows all different applications uh, for the orbital reef. Has any uh, organization or companies actually signed up already as a tenant uh, for this business park, if you will, already? And what's the cost for doing roughly? I'm not at liberty to discuss that one just yet. Um, so I, th I think what we are are seeing is a, is there's a few things in play, and let me just sort of talk about the the, the market more broadly. Um, with the International Space Station still operational. The market is um, highly subsidized today, right? So, so why would someone pay to use a, a platform when they can go get one for free? Well, there's a few answers to that. For some organizations, they've seen that getting to the ISS is very slow. They're looking to come into a place where there's going to be more certainty about schedule. Some places are, are very interested in, in new capabilities. So the ISS built in a very different era. The, a lot of the hardware that was built for analytics, for processing, for computing is very um, dated. And so they're interested in what that next capability is going to be. Some nations just don't have access to the ISS, so they're interested in what comes next. So I think that there's, there's a lot of reasons that people are, are coming into the commercial sector. Um, 
there's also the, the reality that NASA has not done a down select yet. Uh, there are multiple folks out there building space stations. It's actually really exciting that we can think that there's a time where there is now an active competition to build the next space station, right? So I think we're, uh, there's some, some customers that are waiting to see where, which way that, that, that dice rolls. Um, I, I think that the, the folks that are engaging with us today are ab absolutely at the cutting edge uh, of what's possible, and being first is going to have some real opportunities in these markets. Hello. Uh, I understand Blue Origin has made another attempt to secure a contract to build the lunar lander for you know, NASA's future Artemis, Artemis missions. Can you update where you're at with that? NASA is uh, still going through the process of selecting the next round. They call it the SLD, Sustainable Lunar Development Contract. Uh, they are expecting to give out the, those awards at, uh, early this summer. So we are uh, in the competitive phase and being very quiet so as not to disrupt that process. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you so much for um, speaking today. This is such an exciting and innovative um, project. Um, my question is about the, your long-term views of Orbital Reef, specifically with um, tourism and partnerships with hotels. Um, do you have any um, information on that or comment? Yeah, so I, as I mentioned, I think that uh, private space travel is going to be a big market for us. We're already seeing a, a lot of interest there. Um, we have not partnered with a specific hotel brand yet. Uh, we are in development of the, the capabilities and thinking about who, what the right brand is uh, to, to be uh, aligned with. I think when, when uh, I look at my, my team that's working on this, there's a, a great group called uh, Customer Experience. And they're really a very uh, an interesting group because it's a, uh, architects, it's uh, user-centered design experts. It's a, a lot of folks who are thinking about accessibility and how do we design a next generation space station that doesn't look like a military submarine inside. Um, so we're, we're thinking about it from a design standpoint. We're thinking about it from a, a usability standpoint. We're thinking about it from an accessibility standpoint and how do we really continue to make sure that we have the capabilities so that any brand in the world is gonna wanna come and, and play with us later. Thank you so much. Um, uh, a theme that's gone on throughout the day has been um, automation, edge compute capability, and you know it, it's it's uh, in some ways easier to have a human in the loop to actually put hands on things. But where do you see is it is it is it complementary or is it competitive? Some of the solutions that are looking at automation, particularly for bio manufacturing that sort of thing, versus having an actual person you know, with the micro pipette doing, doing work. Yeah, the, the lessons that we have from the ISS are that we need both. Um, Crew time on the ISS today is about $110,000 an hour. So you start to do the math and you realize that automation in many cases is just gonna make more financial sense. Um, as we get to miniaturization, as we get to high throughput, automation has great roles in that. But we're also seeing that sometimes you really need a, a, a skilled scientist who is hands-on with their own science. The history of, of, of the NASA and ESA and JAXA space programs has been that we take really capable folks, usually test pilots, and we try to train them to be scientists, which is very different than saying, I'm going to take the best scientists in the world uh, and put them hands-on with their own hardware and their own science opportunities. So I think that we're gonna see increasingly as people are able to be their own PI, their own operator, that we're gonna see a, a wide range of opportunities that open up in those kinds of things where skill and uh, discernment really matter. Can we get a big round of applause for Erica? Thank you so much. <laughs>